I had focused some time on uh, in, in chapter 20 on the, the millennial kingdom, okay, as to the uh, nature of the kingdom and whether it's in the future or in the past, as some people teach, you know, that it's already in the past. And I strongly disagree with that viewpoint. And I had uh, presented some evidence. I was just uh, today, you know, editing that video and I'll be posting it later today or tomorrow morning. So uh, again, you know, those people who are interested in understanding more about the time of the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ and what will follow, which will be that Satan will be released from his prison of the bottomless pit for a very short season. And uh, that information is was shared with everyone last week. And it is going to be posted in, a, in the video in chapter 20 shortly. So in uh, Revelation 21, so where we have now is we are into eternity here, literally, that the ages of time have come to an end. That does not necessarily mean that time itself is going to come to an end. Time will continue, but eternity does not mean an absence of time. Eternity means an absence of death, so that uh, at no point in time, eternity means like life forever. That's what it means. But we will not be bound by time. Like God is not subject to time. And that's what's going to happen to us, that we will no longer be subject to time, provided we make it to that kingdom. And I pray that all of us are going to, that nothing is going to shipwreck our faith, that we will all be faithful unto death. And we give thanks to our Lord God who has called us who began a good work in us, who is performing it. And we pray that it will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's talk about the new heaven and the new earth. So that, that's the point here is that at that time, by Revelation, by the end of Revelation 20, the day of judgment is behind us, okay? And now it is the end of this present creation. God created this creation back in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He began that creation to fulfill certain purposes, to fulfill his will, what he has purposed in himself before the foundation of the world, as we read in the book of Ephesians, and that it is going to be fulfilled and it is going to be finished. Okay, So by the end of Revelation 20, that purpose has been finished. So the purpose that was going to be served by this present creation, which has gone through multiple ages, it has gone through some catastrophic destructions, both on this earth and in the heavens. And in the end, when we get to the end of this final age, God is not interested in restoring the earth. Like we read in Genesis 1, you know, man, God told man to replenish the earth. He is not interested in replenishing this present earth, the purpose for which this present earth, the present heavens, and even the heaven of God itself was created will have been served and we will go on into the new heaven and the new earth. So Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Passed away, it means it's something to pass away, to perish, okay? To be come to an end. So basically, this heaven and this earth is going to the new heaven and the, I mean, this present heaven and the heavens and the earth, they are, they're expiry, they have an expiry date on it and that date will have arrived by Revelation 21.1 and these will pass away. And, you know, what I love is the symmetry and how God's word, you know, it perfectly uh, matches with different portions of scripture. They're all in harmony. Now, if you go back to the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter one, verse one, we read here in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And this is in the King James Bible, where it tells us specifically that there is going to be God in the beginning created one heaven and one earth. And that is exactly what we read now in Revelation 21, 1, that as the new creation begins, what does it begin with? It begins with a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Okay. So one heaven and one earth were created in the beginning to serve their purpose. 
then they pass away. And what are they replaced by? A new heaven and the new earth. So this new heaven and the new earth are the eternal heaven and the eternal earth. And those ones that were created in the beginning, they were not the eternal ones. They were only meant to exist for a season, a very long one, ages of time that lasted probably, you know, like we have no idea of uh, calculating, but maybe millions and even tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of years, we don't know, but they lasted a very long time. But that purpose has come to an end. So looking back at creation, you know, you can see that, you know, our existence, man, Adam and Eve and his children is very, very recent. Before that, there was such a long history that uh, I have covered in many of my history videos. All that happened for a reason. It was to bring us to this point that we would now be in the eternal kingdom because the heirs of that kingdom will now have been born and mature and grown. And that is the family of God. That is the begotten sons of God who came into existence because and through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross at Calvary. Okay. And these are the children in whom their conscience has been purged of all evil and their conscience, their, their conscience and their and their consciousness which is their mind also has been cleansed of all evil. It is done away with. So they have the mind of Christ. They have the heart of God. They have a pure conscience, just like God does. And therefore they're worthy to be the heirs of God. And therefore God, has, God is going to create this new kingdom, which is going to be domiciled in a new heaven and a new earth. In the beginning, God kept the heaven and the earth separate. That's a, just a little bit of a sidetrack here. The first heaven was not situated on the earth, okay? There's a vast gap in between them. The heaven is the most high and the earth is below. And in between, of course, we have the heavens, which are the sun, moon, stars, and such heavenly bodies. In the beginning, God did not join them together as it happens, as we shall see in Revelation 21. And the reason for that is that heaven represents spirit. The earth represents flesh. So in the beginning, God began with a creation of spirit and of flesh. The creatures of spirit are represented by angels. They're called morning stars in Job 38. The flesh were represented by the sons of God. They were flesh. So the ultimate goal was that God was going to bring forth a new creature who was not just going to be spirit and who was not just going to be flesh, but it was going to be both. Okay, and that is Jesus Christ. He was born in the flesh, but he was, he had a body of flesh, but he was born of the spirit. So spirit and flesh were united in Jesus Christ for the first time. Therefore, people that run around teaching you the angels were having relations with women and producing children, which would have made them spirit flesh creatures. They are all liars because the first union of spirit and flesh took place in Jesus Christ. And this new heaven and the new earth, they are also symbolic because we shall see that the new heaven is going to come down to the earth and they are going to be one, just as spirit and flesh united in Jesus and became one. And that is who the new creatures in Christ are. They are born of the spirit of God, but they also have bodies of flesh. And that is the significance that in the beginning, until these ages were completed and God's purposes had been fulfilled, heaven and earth could not be united in one as they will be in this chapter. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay. This is again symbolic that, you know, this is a building, but it's a living building. This building itself consists of the body of Christ. Okay. It is every member in that building is, is a member of the body of Christ. It's us. In a very real sense, that is what the new Jerusalem is. It is the body of Christ. As we can read here, that this new Jerusalem is compared to the bride of Christ because it very much is. This building is not just going to be building a stone like it was in the first temple in Jerusalem. This is going to be lively stones. This is going to be living, 
building, you know, consisting of living beings, not of dead stones. And 21.3, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Have you ever thought, you know, why is the tabernacle of God not with men right now? Why did God keep his throne up there and put us on the earth down here? Because as I told you, that there, are, there was a work that needed to be done. And until that work was done, this tabernacle could not be situated on the earth, which is the home of mankind. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. See, God is up there. He's kept himself away from us is because at this point in time, we are not ready to be with him. It is not until the new creatures in Christ have become fully grown and matured and become the bride of Christ that God will come and be with them, which is why he began creation in the first place was to create from himself this race, this new creatures in Christ who would be able to relate to him who would be able to have a relationship with him on his level, which is a relationship of adult, mature love. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So with the passing of the first heaven and the first earth, all the evils that have afflicted creation going back a very long time, will also pass away. Death, pain, sorrow, crying, all these afflictions which afflict us, mankind, and I'm sure some of the other creatures in God's creation as well, they will have passed away because evil was created by God for a very specific purpose. That purpose has been fulfilled. And now, there's no more need for evil. And therefore, where does it go? Into the lake of fire. And he said unto me, <clears throat> and, he, and he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. Right? Have you ever stopped and thought about it? Why didn't God make the new in the beginning? Why did he have to go through all this old with this pain and suffering and death and disease and all these things? Why didn't he just make the new in the first place? Because in order for that new to come, we had to go through the old. Death had to come. Pain had to come. Suffering had to come. Again, that's a topic that has been covered many, many times in my videos on why does evil exist? You know, what is the purpose of creation and predestination and such topics? And uh, whoever has not watched those videos and studied the videos, they should do so because it'll give you a better understanding as to why these things happen at the end of the book and not at the beginning. Why didn't they happen in Genesis? Why didn't God just put heaven on the earth and put us together with him? Okay. Why was Adam in the garden and God was not with him? There all the, why was God's you know home not there as well? It wasn't because he was his throne was still in heaven, even when Adam was in that garden. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these things are true and faithful. And again, we are told. Many times in this uh, in this book of Revelation, when John is told, and he said, write them because these things are true. And if you're seeking the truth, this is the only truth there is. That's the only truth we have in this world is God's word. And it is revealed to us by his spirit. And that outside of that, there is no other truth in this world. So thankful that you know God has considered us worthy, that he has blessed us so that we have, have access to his word. Not only that, that he has given us his Holy Spirit who reveals and gives us an understanding of what that word means. And that word indeed is faithful and true. And he said unto me, it is done. Like Jesus said on the cross, you know, it is finished. So it was finished. The work that God began at the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection was finished. But it was the what the result from that would be, that would be the family of this new creatures in Christ, which are the begotten sons of God. You know, for their full revelation to come, there would still be some more period of time that would need to pass. Okay. So like Jesus said, you know, it is finished. 
And now we get to here in Revelation 21, 6, and it said, it is done. That's it. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And this is the water of life that only comes from Jesus Christ. In the garden, there were rivers, you know, but Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they could have drank from the rivers all they wanted, but it was not going to bring them life. That life, which is life eternal, which is the water of life, it has only been made available to us through Jesus Christ. And our faith in him gives us access to this water. And we shall see that this river of life is going to flow out of the throne of God and the Lamb. And we can have whoever is a thirst. Are you a thirst? I am a thirst. I'm very a thirst, as a matter of fact. What are we going to drink of? We're going to drink of life. All these movies and shows, you know, people are looking for the fountain of youth. They want to get the Holy Grail so they can find life and all that. God says, you know, I give it to you freely. Just believe in me. That's all. And those who do, they will be given access to this fountain of the water of life freely. Fountain is something which, you know, which uh, sprays water through pressure. So it's like coming. It's not just a little trickle or a little drop that will be coming out. It'll be like bursting out. Life will be bursting out in this new heaven and the new earth which God is going to create. No more death. All that will be left is life. 21 7, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. This is it. If you want to sum up what God has created everything for, this was it to create for himself a family. What does a family consist of? It consists of relations, people that have a relationship with each other. And that is what God has created that he was going to have people that we will he would have a full relationship with. They would relate to him like he relates to them. They would love him as he loves them. And that is a perfect relationship. And that is how, that's a different topic. That the only way for God, the only thing that grows infinitely is love. Okay? And I'm not going to go into that because that is a different study altogether. Is that only thing that grows is, is love. And God is love. So in order for God to love, he had to create for himself some more copies of himself that would be love and they would love him. In loving each other, the love would continue to multiply and grow forever and ever. And this is how God increases as his love increases. Every begotten son of his is a copy of his love. Okay. And that, my dear friends, is the purpose. And this is what he tells us. He that overcomes. And that is, again, you know, going into this topic of once saved, all they've saved, you know, that, you know, oh, once you confess the name of Jesus, that's it, you're forever and ever in his kingdom. No, because there are always conditions attached to that promise of salvation. And this right here, he that overcomes shall inherit all things. And what is the greatest inheritance of all? Is the inheritance of eternal life. Okay but only if he overcome. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving, see, faith can turn into unbelief, which we have discussed many times in the past as well. And if that happens, the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part of the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The second death essentially is this place of torment and punishment from which there is no escape. The first death, Jesus made the way. Okay? Adam condemns us to death. We were all condemned to the first death. Jesus came. He saved us all from that first death. But sadly, there's not only one death. There's going to be a second one. And one of the groups that is going in there are the unbelieving. It's not just people who never believed in Jesus. It's also those people who once believed in him, but for whatever reason, lost some other things, cares of this life, et cetera, et cetera, choked the word, and they fell into unbelief. Okay. Anyhow, let's continue. The New Jerusalem. So here we have a description of what the city of New Jerusalem is going to be like. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, come hither, 
I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Okay. Again, like, you know, the city is being, is being not just compared to, we are told the city is the lamb's wife. Okay. And that, that again is, you know, like, what does it mean that, you know, we are lively stone? What does it mean that we are the temple of God? What does it mean, you know, that we are, uh, that, that this new Jerusalem is called the lamb's wife? Okay. It is, uh, that is something which again, not going to go into here, but it, it is that this city is not just going to be, like I said, made out of mortar and brick. It is going to be a living place in which God Almighty is going to dwell. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me a great city, holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. You remember, you know, Satan took Jesus up a high mountain and said, you know, look at these kingdoms of the world and I'm going to give them to you. And, you know, Jesus kind of laughed at him because Jesus knew that this was coming. The new Jerusalem was coming. The Jerusalem that's on this earth or any other kingdom for that matter. And he carried me away in the spirit to the great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And that, my friends, is, you know, like when Jesus knew that, you know, this was what uh, God had planned and purpose, why was he going to be tempted by any of these kingdoms on this earth? Not possible. Okay. Having the glory of God and our light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And uh, we are the jewels of God. You know, when uh, God made the anointed cherub back in Ezekiel 28, you know, he had these jewels on him, okay? But he did not understand that the value was not in the precious stones, but it was in the heart of God. And thankfully, we have been given that revelation and that understanding so that, you know, we are going to be adorned. This Graham's wife is going to be adorned like, like you know, no other, with the most precious jewels you can ever imagine. But, you know, the wife herself is not going to herself, is not going to value the jewels. It's not going to be about the golden streets. It's going to be about one who sits on the throne. It's about having a relationship and love for him. That's what's going to be of value. And that's what God has taught us through this old creation, which passed away at the end of Revelation chapter 20. And uh, that it is love that matters. Nothing else matters. All these other things, God can create them, you know, without breaking a sweat. They may be precious because God has deemed them to be precious. But the only thing that is precious for us is God himself. The only one that is precious, I should say, is God himself. And that love he has for us, that's precious and nothing else. Okay. And had a wall, great and high, and 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the and the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Now you don't have this, this idea that this city has gates. That means you, know, you can come in and out of those gates. So you know that that again tells you that in the future there's going to be a greater creation which is going to extend beyond the boundaries of this city, but it is the city itself that is going to rule, that all those who are going to be kings and priests are going to be the inhabitants of that city, okay? So we who are going to be the living stones that comprise the city, this is where we are going to have our position as the heirs of God, because these gates are going to lead out to those domains and those dominions which God is prepared for us so that uh, when you, and if you are an heir and a king, then you will need a kingdom. And that's what's going to be coming in the future are uh, these other kingdoms and these other, you know, uh, regions and dominions that we have no idea about what they're going to be like. But when we find out, I don't know what kind of words or, you know, how amazed we will be. There's no way for us to even begin to comprehend that at this present time. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. This is a study in itself, you know, why there's the names of the 12 tribes and other 12 apostles are written in there. 
uh, and, uh, you know, not the other uh, great people in the Bible, such as, for example, uh, Moses or the prophets or Abraham, even Isaac and Jacob, but uh, 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. But that is something which I have not really given a great deal of thought to, so I'm going to pass that on. And he talked with me, and he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Okay, this is a unit of measurement. So this, this, uh, this city, just like all of God's creation, you can read in Isaiah that, you know, God has measured the heavens with a span. He has weighed the mountains and the balances, etc. So there are, you know, there are measurements that went into the first creation. The same thing here, this, uh, this city itself has certain dimensions and there are 12,000 furlongs. Furlongs is uh, something, you know, people, what is a furlong? Let's take a look at it, okay? A space or distance of about 600 feet, okay? 600 Greek feet in length. So I don't know how much that actually translates into 600 feet. So uh, a mile is, I think, about 5,400 feet or something like that. So uh, that means that uh, 600 times nine, so about nine furlongs would be one mile. So 1,200 divided. So it'd be like, you know, something like a thousand or 1,200 miles long or something, which is a enormous size. You know, when you really think about it, like with our, there's nothing on this earth right now that even begins to compare, you know, to, to the, the dimensions of this city, okay? But then again, God doesn't do things on a small basis. You know, everything he does is like totally, look at the size of this creation that he made. He made it for us to, you know, to teach us certain things, mainly about evil, to uh, you know, to, to to let us allow us to become evil, so that he could he could understand good, and in the end, come to the understanding of love. And uh, look at the size of the creation he made in the present time. So again, you know, what's going to come is going to be even bigger and more grand, much more grand. So there's nothing in this cre present creation, I believe, even the present heaven that compares to the new one that is going to come. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So it is uh, not necessarily a cube, but uh, the length, breadth, and height are going to be equal because the height can the big, you know, like it can uh, taper off on the top or whatever. So it could be a cube shape, and you know, maybe it is because we understand that the cube is a very one of these occult symbols that is used a lot. For example, you have this cube in Mecca, and uh, you know, a lot of companies, etc., use a cube as a symbol. So what the significance of that is, again, something I do not know. We'll have to wait and see. And he measured the wall thereof, 140, uh, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of man, that is of the angel. So these measurements are, again, provided in there. But I believe, again, like there's been so much corruption in all the measurements of time, of weights, et cetera, that are recorded in the Bible that it probably is not even wise for us to try and calculate it in modern like pounds or kilograms or something, or in you know, feet or miles or kilometers, what the dimensions are. We'll just have to wait and see what it is going to be, okay? And the building of the wall of it was Jasper and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with ma all manner of precious stones, the first foundation was Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third uh, Chalcedony, the fourth an Emerald, the fifth Sardonyx, the sixth Sardius, the seventh Chrysolite, chrysolite the eighth Beryl, the ninth a Topaz, the tenth a Chysoprasus, the eleventh a Jacinth, and the twelfth an Amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. So it is, this is again reflective of the glory of God. It is like, you know, so far beyond anything that exists on this earth today. 
that there's no way with our limited minds are we even going to begin. All I can say is that when we do see this, you know, our jaws are going to drop straight below our knees. You know, that's that's what it's going to be. It's like you'll be left, you know, with gaping mouth hanging open, looking at this thing for probably a few centuries or something, you know, because it's going to be so spectacular. And I saw no, saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb or the temple of it. Yeah. So this is again, you know, substantially different. This new creation, which has been the purpose of creation, is to bring in the new. Eventually, after many ages had passed and many things had happened, it is not going to require like any temple, even like in the present heaven, there is a tabernacle of God, but no more. Because in it, the Lamb, God the Father, and his children, we're all going to be one. So there's going to be no requirement for any tabernacle or a temple because God is going to dwell in us and we are going to be his temple. Okay. And that's a temple is simply a dwelling place for God. That's what it is. And we will be the one that God will be dwelling in it. Okay. And when it says the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb of the temple of it, it means that just as God is dwelling in us, we will be dwelling in God. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it's just totally, I'm at a loss for words. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it for the glory of God to lighten it and the Lamb is the light thereof. Then we're going to see true light. In uh, Genesis 1-3, there's a very interesting scripture, which everybody knows, but you know, hardly anybody thinks about it. It says, God said, let there be light. So that was the day one. So God, you know, light. And there was light, the Bible tells us. But people don't stop and think that the sun itself did not come into existence until the fourth day. So that light that first came, became visible, was spiritual light. That is the light of God in the Lamb that let creation, even this present one, in the beginning until man's eyes, God knowing, would be blinded to that light. He had to create for them a physical light, the physical sun and the physical moon and the stars to give light because we are not capable of seeing real light, which is God. But here we will be able to. And that is why there's going to be no need of a sun and a moon in there. It is going to be the God the God who is light, he is going to be visible. Right now, God is invisible to us, the Bible tells us, but no longer. Okay, That's where we will have arrived at that time. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it. Kings of the earth. Right? Isn't that interesting? That the city sits on the earth. So obviously the earth is bigger than the city itself. And as I said before, that there are going to be gates which are going to allow access out of the city and into the city. And what do we read here? That there are going to be kings on the earth, which obviously have their kingdoms outside of the city because the king in that city is God Almighty himself. But we also are being, you know, we have been told we are going to be kings and priests with him. And therefore, these kingdoms of his children are going to exist on the earth outside of the boundaries of this city. What these kingdoms are going to be like, who are going to be the subjects in this kingdom, that is something I have no idea. Okay, I don't even want to speculate on it. We'll again have to wait and see till we get there. So let's all keep praying that we are going to get there. Okay, let's not all take our salvation for granted. Let's work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And let us always remember to give thanks to the Lord our God, to be ever grateful for the work that he alone has done by sending his only begotten son to die for us on the cross, to shed his blood, which blood has now made it possible for our consciences to be washed pure so that we can be worthy of being declared to be the bride of God. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nations, that's an interesting choice of word here. Okay. 
because that word means ethnos, ethnicity. Why will there be ethnicities here, nations, etc.? That again is something can't say. What we are looking into, what we have been given a glimpse into here in, in chapter 21 is which is something so far beyond anything that we can use as a comparison on this earth that it is even impossible to speculate on it. Okay. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day and there shall be no night there and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Having this information available to us, that God had created this creation which is destined for a very fiery end as we read about in Second Peter in chapter 3. Okay, Even the elements are going to melt. Then you know what? We shouldn't put any hope in this life or in this world. We should look beyond it. And we have been given the glimpse of what lies beyond. And what lies beyond is a total becoming one with God. Just like Adam and Eve, you know, Adam said that, you know, uh, for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And now we are going to be one spirit with God in this life. We have only a very, you know, uh, a weak connection, you could say. We are one, but not fully, because we still have our flesh to deal with and contend with. When that is done away with, then we are going to be completely one with our Creator, with our Lord God. And that is something which is what we should be desirous of every day. And we should be working towards and we should be praying for. And we should be giving, you know, putting everything on the line for that. And nothing in this world should be so valuable to us that we forsake that eternity which has been promised to us. All right. So that's the end of Revelation chapter 21. I know, you know, like the, 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 this, uh, this 21 in particular, I find this to be such a uh, difficult chapter to really comprehend and understand because this is something which is really the culmination of everything that God has been planning for so very long, executing those plans over such a long period of time that, you know, I know I have really failed in trying to convey what God has conveyed to us in this chapter. So I will recommend that you study for it your, for yourself you know, add to it, to my understanding, share what you know about it, what you have studied, so that, you know, we can all grow in it. But suffice it is for us to realize that, you know, this is the fulfillment of God's promise, and uh, God cannot lie. So that's what we hope for. That is our hope. And that is what we are now at the cusp we are really at that time where this could be fulfilled in a very, very short period of time now. And therefore, this time, even though it may be a time of tribulation and times are going to get much harder, we can yet look beyond all of that to this chapter and we can give thanks because we know just as surely as these events have happened that God has prophesied, so will this. And therefore, all we need to do is to get through this time, get through this life, and hang on to our faith, hold on to it, don't let go of it, and we will be there with all the other great cloud of fitnesses. All right, so please, uh, let's have a little time of fellowship. Sorry, I had a very long day today, so I'm a little bit tired, and also I didn't, uh, I don't think I did a very good job on it. Maybe I'll come back and uh, do a study on this separately at another time. But uh, if somebody uh, has something to add, you know, or share whatever may be on their mind, please go right ahead. Hey, Paul Sandu. Sorry, uh, no joke. I probably got five minutes of everything you shared, shared because I was helping my son fall asleep and we're, me and my wife were praying for the family. Um, can you hear me okay? I can, yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, the only part I really caught, and I really will, I'll, I'll listen later, but there's one part um, was about the, the, about the four found the the 12 foundations yeah and um um 
it was I was you know at one time I was thinking it was a square too, but I thought I thought I was thinking about twelve foundations, and I noticed that there's this, this also there's also the obsession not just with squares but also uh, cubes but also crosses like Maltese cross you know like the the red cross symbol yes, and in, yes. uh, if you look at the corners the cross has twelve points which I thought well maybe it's also a cross sh- shape. Anyways, that's my thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, could be, could be. Yes, the people have speculated on uh, on those size and uh, you know the shape, etc. So uh, the only way we're gonna really know for sure is when we see it. I don't think it's gonna be revealed before that time. And you know what? What a wonderful surprise that will be. And uh, so we might as well wait for it. Uh, Jessica, did you put your hand up? The motive. Can you please speak up a little bit? Oh, uh, hang on. Let's hear you in your loud, booming voice. Oh, no, see, I can't win, sir. <laughs> I do... Stop it, you. <laughs> I can't win. Is that better? No, no, Is it's it better. better. No, you were coming through very faint, so it's it's good. Yeah, speak up a little oh. bit. I'll get closer to the microphone. Okay, sorry. Um, no, I agree with what Nate said about the four points. I think he might have a point there. Um, the other thing I noticed, you know, when you were talking about furlong, um, I noticed that, it, what was it? It was the um, verse uh, of walking a mile in another person's shoes. And then there's another one, isn't there? Um, you should go not one mile, but two. Yes. Is there a difference with measurements? Spiritually, we've got to work harder. That's the message, obviously, I, I believe. Um, but is it different? Is there a difference? I don't know. Is there a difference here? You know, like we have to do miles, but furlongs are in in other things. Yes, you know, I, obviously it seems like there is a difference. Why that is so, I don't know. I mean, why why was uh, the measurement of furlong? Like it does say that it is a measurement of a man and of an angel. Okay, so maybe these are these are measurements that are uh, you know different measurements up in the heaven. Could be. Ah, that, that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so, so I don't know. Furlongs and mile. You know, we are to walk a mile. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, exactly. Running. Yeah. It's a spiritual thing. You know, yeah, sorry. And a mile being longer than a furlong, you know, it also is that uh, we, God is uh, telling us to have stamina that, you know, when somebody's testing your patience or whatever, like you say, you know, go with me a mile and you offer to go a two, you know, that mile alone could be a very testing time, but uh, but we are, we are to be ready to, to go twice that distance. All right, in that case, uh, let's call it a night. Tomorrow we are planning on having a little fellowship with, uh, you know, uh, Stanley and some of uh, his wonderful family and other, you know, members of uh, the church, et cetera. So, in that meeting, you know, I would like to uh, hopefully have it all of them present, and that'll be a wonderful time. All right, so I wish you all a wonderful and blessed evening and morning and afternoon, wherever you are, in our Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, just look at that. We are almost at the end of this uh, race here now, this time, you know, there really is a special time that, you know, all those after, especially after understanding history, that we are at this time where we're going to be going into eternity, you know, yeah, there's going to be a thousand years, but a thousand years is nothing in between. And that's something which is such a special time. No wonder angels desire to look into it and all these things that we have been freely given as a blessing from God. So let's, uh, let's not, you know, let's not get too uh, pressured. Tribulation means pressure. Let's not get too pressured or too stressed by the trials of this life which uh, we all face, but uh, probably we will also uh, have to go through some very hard times before we get to the end of this race. So I pray that all of us, you know, will keep this end in mind that, you know, there is the light, God's light at the end of this dark tunnel. Okay, thank you very much. God bless you all. Let's uh, meet again tomorrow.